Well, here I am, nothing's happening, no trout are rising yet. And that's pretty much common on any trout stream. We'd always love to have fish feeding on the surface all day long, but the fact of the matter is, there's usually only a few hours during the day when we have quality dry fly fishing. And if we're gonna be successful, we need to be able to fish down where the fish live. Because when you uh, study the trout's diet, the largest percentage of their food is gonna be nymphs and, and larvae of caddis flies and other aquatic uh, insects and uh, non-insects. So we need to be able to tie some of these patterns if we're gonna be set up to really be successful fishing this kind of water. So I wanna show you a couple of nymph patterns that I've found to be really successful for me. When we look at flies for spring creeks, most of the time we're thinking about dry flies, fish feeding on the surface, but there's a lot of the times during the day when fish aren't feeding on the surface and we're gonna need to go down and use some nymphs. And some of the mayfly nymphs that I found most effective are the swimming variety. There are actually four groups of mayfly nymphs, all mayflies, can be fitted into one of these four groups, and, and those are clingers that live in fast water, uh, very flat, and they hold themselves to the rocks in heavy current. You don't find a lot of those usually in slow-moving spring creeks. Burrowers that live in the little burrows in the mud. Then we have the crawlers, and they're really common. There's a lot of them. They're usually kind of streamlined looking, and they crawl around on the weeds and also the rocks on the bottom. And then the fourth group are called swimming nymphs. And these are free swimming. They'll live in the aquatic vegetation usually and they'll swim from one place to another fairly rapidly, very streamlined. And that's the type of nymph I'm gonna tie here. I'm using is a Timco model 3761, which is just a good standard uh, nymph hook. It's a little heavier wire. You don't need to add any weight to it because you might be fishing in very shallow, slow moving water. I like to use a, a dark thread with a light material, and that way I can get a little more of a translucent effect. So we're going to put the thread on here. And then we're gonna use some ribbing on it with some wire, and you can use whatever color wire seems to fit the color scheme of the nymph. This one I'm gonna use a copper colored wire. You might be wondering why we're not putting a tail on here yet, and that's gonna come later. Different than a lot of flies, the tail is gonna come on after we tie the body. We'll put this ribbing out of the way. And then I'm gonna use some, some uh, ostrich hurl. You could also use marabou, but we want an effect of showing the little gills. We wanna really show some life to this nymph. Make it look like it's alive, and we might be uh, using it, applying a little action to it sometimes, especially if we were using it like in a little back slough or even in a lake. Uh, Two of the common mayfly types are called betus and calabetus, and both of those are nymphs that swim pretty rapidly, and some of them do live in lakes as well, especially calabetus. Now this ostrich hurl is tapered. The, it's thick down here near the stem, and then it gets thin out towards the end, and that way we can adjust how, what portion of this we use according to the hook size. In other words, if I'm gonna use a real small nymph, like an 18, I would start wrapping this way out on the end so I get very short barbels to make the tapered body. This is a little bigger one, and it's a number 12, so I'm gonna move down the hurl away so I can get some 
plenty of body for the nymphs. Tie this in right at the bend of the hook. Now, as with other types of hurl like peacock, if we just wind this hurl like this, it might look good, but it's not very durable and it'll come unraveled as soon as we start fishing it. So we want to reinforce it with the thread. Another advantage of reinforcing it with the thread is I'm using kind of a cream colored hurl, but if I use olive thread and twist the hurl around the thread, then I'll get kind of an olive effect on the nymph. I'm going to use my little dubbing twister and I'm going to make a little loop just a little shorter than the length of hurl that I have. Hold the loop around my finger and then I'm going to pinch the hurl with my finger and thumbs, hold it in place, use this cowbird dubbing twister, come inside of the loop, over the hurl, hook the thread on the other side and pull down and this should lock this in place. Then I can just twist this and it makes me like a little rope now that I can wind forward to form the body. And I'm just, you could move this to your hackle pliers, but if you're careful, you can just leave it attached to the dubbing twister and just start winding forward. This will really give a nice effect of, of gills on the fly when we finish. And the gills are what are going to add a little lifelike look to this little swimming nymph. It looks pretty fuzzy right now and not very streamlined, but we'll fix that here with a little modification. Tie a couple of wraps of thread and then we can cut the excess. Now that's why it was important we've got our ribbing here and so we can add the tails now. And you can use a variety of materials for the tails. You can use some grouse hackle or, or partridge or even uh, just off of a hen saddle. One material I use a lot is pheasant tail. I think pheasant tail's got a great uh, color scheme. I think it really looks good in the water. And I'm going to take about six or eight fibers of pheasant tail and make sure that the tips are fairly even because this is going to serve two purposes. It's going to be the tail of the fly, but it's also going to act as the back over the back of the, of the gills. So we'll lay it right over the top, hold it in place, and tie it in. A couple of turns of thread. Now as far as how long to make these, the tails need to extend back about half the length of the hook shank. You don't need real long tails on this type of a nymph. Now while I'm holding these tails in place, now I'm going to bring my ribbing forward and very carefully I'm just going to look up here where I can get over the top and work the wire through these protruding barbels of, of uh, ostrich hurl so that I can form my gills. Make one more little turn up here and we've, we've got now the back of the nymph and the tails in place. What we may want to do, now I'm looking I rotate this around and some of these gills have kind of gotten wrapped up under the ribbing and, and this little tool here is called a dubbing teaser and it's just got a rough edge on it and I can just kind of slide it along the edge real carefully here and just kind of pick out some of these gills. Another thing is mayflies don't have gills on the bottom of the body. The gills come out of the sides of the abdomen so what I want to do is come down here to kind of get the right taper on this fly and I'm going to just clip the excess off the bottom with my scissors real carefully so that I don't clip it off the sides. There we go. 
Now we're ready to put on the wing case. And you can use a variety of materials for the wing case. In fact, you can use almost anything. I could take some of these uh, pheasant tail fibers if I want to, but the effect that I want is a little bit more uh, shine to this. I don't want to use like a real bright tinsel, but there's a material called pearl tinsel that works. And when we lay this over as a wing case, the term that this kind of wing case is called as a flashback. And a lot of times uh, a flashback is a real effective nymph. You can, one of my favorites is a pheasant tail flashback nymph. And the, the advantage of the flashback is that when nymphs are moving about in the water and especially when they're getting ready to emerge, they get little bubbles, little air bubbles on them. And, and these bubbles, when viewed from under the water, really have kind of a shine to them. And I think it's an attractiveness that this will provide the nymph to make it a little more effective. Now, this is spooled pearl tinsel. You can also buy this pearlescent in a flat sheet and just cut the wing case the shape you want it. I'm using the large size because it comes in large, medium, and small. And a size 12 hook is a little bigger than even the large uses, so I'm going to double this over one time and I can get just a little more width on it. So I've just tied it on and then looped it back forward so I've got a double thickness of it. And then we're going to put the, the thorax on here. And the thorax, we want to use a real rough dubbing. I'm going to use some wax here to make this adhere a little better to the thread. And putting this rough dubbing, we want, if we put some, like this is a hair's ear blend with some Antron to give it a little more shine. Real rough, fuzzy dubbing. And what I'm going to do is kind of break this up and rough it up even more in my fingers. And then I can use the dubbing method of either using a dubbing loop, which takes a lot of time. And from all the commercial time that I did, always trying to speed things up, instead of a dubbing loop, I just use the method that of starting the dubbing and then just wrapping it and holding it in place. And every time I make a turn, it pulls a little more dubbing off from the thread. And I can just build that up to the size I want, and when I'm through, when I get it the way I want, then I can just pull the rest of this off and out of the way. Really makes a rough appearance. And with that tied really rough, I'm, I don't need to tie any legs on this nymph. These swimming nymphs have real small little legs anyway, because they only use them just to hold on to the vegetation. They don't have to have heavy legs to attach them to protect them from a rough current or anything. And when mayflies swim, they pretty much have their legs down at their side anyway. So we're going to pull the wing case forward now and tie it off. Make a couple of turns there. And then we'll finish the head. This is a very simple little mayfly nymph to tie, but yet it's extremely effective. And I will use it in a variety of situations. When I'm fishing in, in Spring Creek, so frequently I'm sight fishing to fish. That's where I can, can see a fish holding in the water, and I actually cast to the fish that I see. And when I use that method, I almost always use one of these little nymphs in either this light color or in the a rusty color. And I also use it if I'm just kind of probing the water in, in slow water when I've got some little channels between the weed beds, I can cast this little nymph and let it sink and just kind of twitch it a little bit and give a kind of a swimming motion. 
Really an effective little nymph, simple to tie. And one other time you really want to have this kind of a nymph is if you're fishing in a float tube and either in a slough that's off the side of a, of a spring-fed stream or even on a lake and you see trout feeding on the surface and you know they're taking flies on the surface, but if you'll take one of these little swimming nymphs and cast just ahead of the cruising trout, just kind of twitch it a little bit so that it appears to be swimming just under the surface, I can almost guarantee that you're going to get a good slam on this because this is a real lively looking little uh, pattern and you need to have some in your fly box. One of the nymphs that I've found real effective on most of the spring creeks that I fish, and certainly on a lot of tailwater streams, are caddis larvae.